Happy 3rd of July, everybody, and a belated happy Canada Day to all of you Canadian listeners out there. And yeah, happy 4th. Big weekend. Have fun. Do it safely. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Fantasy Football today, everybody. Today we're talking about not players we're worried about, but players we're worried about being wrong about, which is a fun topic, even if it's not the most gracefully worded, I suppose. But Saturday is 4th of July at Heath's Meet. What will you be cooking up uh, on 4th of July? Uh, just today bought two, uh, pork shoulders. Going to make some pulled pork on the smoker on Saturday. Happy, uh, Independence Eve. Uh, okay. Pulled pork. Not the most yeah. American. Not the most 4th of July. Doesn't it have to be burgers, hot dogs, or chicken? Listen, are, are we going to fight like now? <laughs> like I thought we would save the fight for a few minutes. Okay. You are nowhere close to the arbiter of what is and is not American. I wear a red shirt. I have a blue CBS blanket behind me, and I have white sunlight co- bathing me right now behind me. So, pretty no one like wants a big to American think about flag. you bathing. <laughs> All right, Ben, what's uh, what's on the menu for Fourth of July? Oh, I, I don't have any plans yet. I'm not. I'm not nearly the barbecue Heath is. Yeah. I mean, we'll just figure something out. That's kind of the way that we we play it. All right. Well, I got my hot dogs today. My chicken. Gonna make some chicken burgers. Gonna be fun. I hope everybody chicken enjoys their burgers. Holiday. Chicken Wait, burgers, yeah. You're making chicken burgers, and you're telling me that I'm not American for <laughs> smoking pulled pork. What, the, who, what are you talking about? I'm trying to be a little bit healthy. The hot dogs are so bad for you, you know. Uh, but it is going to be weird to not have burgers. You but know, you're still making the hot dogs. Still making the hot dogs, yeah. So uh, you could have just done burgers instead. You're, the hot dogs you're are so offsetting good. the really bad for you. No, hot the hot dogs, dogs chicken are burgers. A special brand of hot dog that's only available up here. Just so good. Um, you know what? You, you know what I want to invent? A uh, a bag of like four hamburger buns. Everybody's got the same problem, right? You can only buy them in eights, and you're not gonna make eight, and you got leftover I think, buns. I think the gluten free buns generally come in packs of four. Oh, gross! Yeah. I don't eat gluten free buns either. I just don't eat buns. <laughs> but I believe the gluten free buns when my wife buys them for the kids actually That's do come smart. in packs. That's of very four. good. That's very good. I, they're actually, I kind of like gluten free. I just that's because nobody could afford eight gluten free anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same price as eight regular books. Hey, uh, the preseason's been cut to two games and possibly zero. That, yeah, yeah, it hasn't actually been. Nothing's been done yet, right? Oh, I thought of. I thought they were cutting it to two. Uh, I thought well, the NFL agreed had, upon yet. Yeah, the NFL is proposed to the NFL Players Association has not agreed to anything. I don't think. Okay. All right. Uh, and they might do. They might say zero. Yeah. So, well, uh, should we wait until we find out how many? But I mean, if there are zero preseason games, is that rookie alert? Like, avoid those rookies or wait another round or something like that. I mean, I don't know what it means. We've never had zero preseason games. I mean, we'd just be guessing, right? Like, yeah. I that, don't that, think it would be better for the rookies. Yeah. It would probably be worse, but maybe it wouldn't have an like I know Pete Prisco had tweeted out when they announced they were only gonna have two or when the NFL said they were suggesting two. Pete had said good, more time for them to get in actual work that matters or something to that effect. Um I like I don't think people should take it as oh the coaches don't get to see them in games. Like that matters probably a little bit, but probably not a lot. They get to see them on the practice field. Although yeah. with with all the hitting and tackling rules that they have now if we don't have any preseason games, everybody might put up 40 in week one. <laughs> I was just going to look up what like Terry McLaurin and, and Marquise Brown did in the preseason last year. Cause to my recollection, you know, some of these guys that had big rookie seasons didn't necessarily have monster preseasons. The starters don't usually play a lot of the times when they're, they're looking like they're going to be starters. They don't even necessarily play, even if they are rookies. Uh, I mean, they play, but they don't play a lot, right? You don't get a ton of snaps, like he said. Like they, the, the the preseason games matter, but they don't matter that much. Um, and if it does put them back, I mean, imagine a scenario where it required a, a big preseason game for a rookie to prove himself. Well, he got that opportunity in the preseason. He proved himself. Well, I mean, why wouldn't he just do that in week one or in week two, and then by week three be at the point he was at in week one. You know what I mean? Like how far behind will he really be? Well, I'll tell you, we talk about the rookies all the time. We don't really talk much about the teams with new coaching staffs. And yeah. I'm a little concerned about that. You know, it's it's not going to be that easy to have 
no off season, you know, no OTAs, right? You, a very abbreviated off season. Hopefully, a full training camp, but still, the, you don't get the rookie mini camps, you don't get the OTAs, all that stuff. That's been canceled, and then a lack of preseason games and just a lack of FaceTime. You know, it's I, well, you may have a, like, face them on your phone, <laughs> but a lack of actual time communicating with each other. I think it's going to put those teams with new offenses, new coaches, potentially at a disadvantage. And it's a very strongly worded statement there. Yeah, no, I agree with you 100%, actually. One of the th- things I'm writing for our second edition of our magazine is kind of like what could go wrong for the top 12 players. And it's really, really, really hard to find things that could go wrong for Christian McCaffrey that don't involve injury. And I try not to speculate on that. But one of the things is they were well above average in terms of the number of offensive plays they ran last year, like 1,076 or something. Um, first year play callers, even Cliff Kingsbury are generally below average in terms of that. And in Carolina, you've got a guy that's never been an NFL head coach and a guy that's never been an NFL offensive coordinator. And I do think that like though that practice of calling plays in a game format could actually help them a little bit before we get to the season. If they don't get to do that, we may have to worry a little bit about the, the pace in Carolina. If I like that. if McCaffrey, Barkley, and Zeke are the first three picks of a draft, all three of them have new head coaches. But Zeke, of course, has the same play caller, so that would be good. Okay, I, you go I, ahead. Adam, I, you said you kind of weren't making a strong statement. Maybe it would be not that big of a deal. I mean, the point I was making with rookies was I think if a rookie receiver or a rookie running back is talented enough, is good enough, it will show up in practice. He'll make his way under the field. I would go a lot further on the coaches and I agree with your point and I would I would be more more extreme on the coaches like I don't think it will affect the rookies necessarily I think good players play well but I think your point on on coaches we should definitely be taking into consideration and I'm going to put a lot more weight on offenses that have continuity on on offenses we know will be good I mean like what what is wrong with the idea of just going after chiefs in the first couple of rounds or going after you know players on these offenses that we know what their roles will be and, 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 you know, how their offenses will function saints and um, even the Falcons, you know, they're not a great offense, but they're going to be pass heavy and they have most of the, the returners back those types of situations. I think they're going to be at an advantage. Travis Kelsey, Tyree kill at the one, two turn, bam, game take, over. Take Mahomes in the third and you've won your league. Bam. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, let's get started with uh, the players we're worried about being wrong about. First, I'm going to just tell you what's coming up. we got a big week. You're going to hear the three of us a lot next week. It's projections week, so Heath and Ben are going to basically steal the show. I'm just going to just gonna drive the car and let these guys uh, take it. Well, no, they're going to drive the car. I'm just going to put gas in the car. I'm not sure where the analogy is. I'm going to sit down and shut up and let them talk about their projections next week. We're covering every division Monday through Thursday, two divisions each day. We're going to finish with a mailbag on Friday. We also have a mailbag today with your Apple podcast questions and your emails, fantasy football at CBSI.com. I'm going to be about, I'm going to be a little bit wealthier next week. Cause I, we have a poker night on Twitch. I plan on winning that once again. So that's Tuesday night. Come join us for poker night. And we got a newsletter for you to sign up for, cbssports.com slash newsletter, fantasy football content, right to your inbox. Really good. Co- We're rolling out a ton of content now. So this is a great way to stay up to date. And we have a lot of newsletters, by the way, not just fantasy football. So you can check the ones that you want uh, on cbssports.com slash newsletter. So I think this is fun that uh, the top five players were worried about being wrong about. Two of them from Heath are Le'Veon Bell and Chris Carson. And they were on Ben's... I don't want to draft them at the current cost list. Not quite a bust list, but similar. They were they were discussed yesterday at length. So, Heath, um, you're higher on Le'Veon Bell and Chris Carson than Chris and Jamie are, right? I don't know what Chris has him ranked at, but I am <laughs> higher than Chris. Dave and Jamie and Ben, I'm pretty sure. I have not seen Chris's rankings. <laughs> Chris, um, wow. But I kind of feel like Chris <laughs> usually leans more my way. Yeah. So we might be in a similar place <laughs> on Levy and Bale. The, the problem is, like, I have moved past the idea that everybody's just crazy and Levy on Bell should be a second round pick, which if you told me he was getting the same volume as he did last year, I would say everyone's crazy. Le'Veon Bell should be a second round pick, but the Frank Gore thing, there's some concerns that maybe he doesn't get the same volume. The problem is like where he's being drafted in our drafts is the fourth round in 
NFC drafts, he's the 19th running back off the board. Like, it's not as if he's being drafted thinking he's going to get the same amount of work. He's being drafted to be worse than he was last year. And what, what the do type you... of touchdown regression he should have coming, even if he takes a hit in volume and doesn't have huge positive regression and efficiency, which I think he should have at least some. Um, he was way, way, way below his career norms last year. Like, even if he doesn't get quite the same volume, I think he'll be as good as where he's being drafted right now. Now, the way I could be wrong and the way it could destroy me is that I draft Le'Veon Bell in the fourth round of all these drafts, and then he just has nothing, and he's the third down back, and Frank Gore's getting the early down work. So yeah, how worried are you about being wrong about Le'Veon? I get more worried every time I draft him in the fourth round because I've got a lot of exposure to him. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I, I don't... Honestly, I don't think it's that likely that Le'Veon Bell plays 16 games this season and f- doesn't finish as a top 15 to 18 running back in PPR. And he's the 19th running back off the board, so I'm just going to keep drafting him. I guess I'm not actually that concerned about How many him. touchdowns do you have him projected for? Six or seven? He scored four uh, last year. Three rushing, one receiving. And he finished 21st in non-PPR, 16th in PPR. 7.2. So I, I've got him at... Um, Which might be the most by an Adam Gase running back since, like, Denver. That's well, that's a <laughs> no, good joke. No, really? It's, not it's, actually it's a very true. small it's amount. not true at all. Didn't, didn't Jay, close. Didn't Jay Ajayi, <laughs> did Jay Ajayi exploded under Adam Gase, didn't he? Kenyon Drake, I'm pretty sure, had seven touchdowns in a year. No, like, but, but Jay Ajayi was all late in the season, so I don't know what he did. But but that was, like, that was Adam Gase. Yeah, like Ajayi... Yeah. Like I Went only nuts. have him at 3.8 yards per carry, 226 carries, um, like 1,300 total yards and seven touchdowns. But if he's going to catch 60 passes again and he has 1,300 yards and seven touchdowns, he's absolutely going to be a top 15 running back. Okay, what's DPR, your for sure. yeah. what's your concern about Chris Carson being being wrong? You're worried about being wrong about Chris Carson. Where do you have Chris Carson? Again, I mentioned this yesterday. He goes 40th overall in NFC. That's RB 22. In our most recent CBS draft, he went 28th overall. So big difference there. Um, I, I consider him a yeah. I consider him around three pick, more like 30th. Like, like I, I, I don't time. consider him in my mind. So it's not that I think he's. I consider him that his ADP will be in the third round. I'm surprised it's as low as it is on NFC. Yeah, if we get to training camp and he's not fully participating, then I think that 40 could even, he, he could even get lower. I'm My assumption is that the Seahawks have been forthcoming and that Chris Carson is mostly okay and that Rashad Penny's not going to be ready for the start of the season and Carlos Hyde is going to be Chris Carson's backup. And I don't really agree personally with the idea that Chris Carson's a trap back because he's been used more in the passing game than Rashad Penny has, and he will certainly be used more than Carlos Hyde. And he generally gets a ton of work and will score plenty of touchdowns. So my concern about being wrong with Chris Carson is that he's not 100%, and Carlos Hyde is has a much bigger role than what I'm anticipating. But if he's 100% to start the season, another guy, I've got him 13th at running back. I think he should absolutely be a third-round pick, and I think he's kind of a steal in the fourth. Ben, I know you you went through the case yesterday. If you want to make a an abridged version of what concerns you about Chris Carson. No, I just want to say Adam Gase, his last three offenses have rushed for four, seven, and six touchdowns. <laughs> Jeez. I was I have I have Le'Veon Bell at 7.2 total touchdowns, only <laughs> sure, 4.6 sure. rushing. I know, I know, but I thought that was just a hilarious stat. They have not run for more than seven touchdowns in three years. And last year, uh, Le'Veon Bell ran for three, and no other running back ran for one. The other three were Sam Darnold and uh, receiver Vincent Smith, which is just amazing. That's pathetic. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you uh, Chris? Yeah, okay, I called you Chris because I was talking about Chris Carson. That's why I just called you Chris just now. But Heath, are you concerned about them – throwing the ball more this year, like more than ever, more than in recent years? Um, I think they'll throw it more than they did two years ago. I have them throwing it more than their three-year average. But no, I don't think that they are going to throw it more than league average. Um, I think they're likely to still run the ball more than the average team does. 
And I think that Carson's still likely, I mean, he's pretty much always just been hyper efficient and they have a good run offense with good run blocking and Russell Wilson makes it easier for Carson. Like my really, honestly, only concern with Chris Carson is that he's not healthy. If he's healthy, he's going to smash his ADP. So here's, I'll be really quick, but my case yesterday, Heath, was that he was essentially averaging well over 75% snap shares. Um, There's a couple games where he dipped down, so maybe not averaging, but he was over 75% and very frequently over 85% or I don't know if very frequently is accurate, but he definitely was at least four different times in the middle of the season. I'm looking at the snap logs now and several other games in the high 70s or low 80s. So that workload was, you know, very helpful to him to, he was dominating all the touches. He was dominating the whole backfield. I agree with you that he's not necessarily a trap back. He was, he caught more passes and you have Carlos Hyde in town now, instead of, you know, the, I don't know who else will catch passes. I mean, it seems like Carson will be their leading, their leading receiver out of the backfield, but I just think with Hyde and with DJ Dallas and, and now his injury, I think it's really hard to imagine a scenario where they're going to play him that much. Like why it seems like they're probably going to move back and he kind of needs that big of a workload to be able to put up the numbers and and get the touches that he got last year. Heath, you've got Clyde Edwards, Elair and Jonathan Taylor. Edwards, Elair is going 18th in NFC. Jonathan Taylor, 32nd in our most recent CBS draft. They both went around their ADPs round two for Edwards, Elair round three for Jonathan Taylor. Now you're, you worried about being wrong about these two rookies is that because you are low on them and you're worried that they're actually going to be amazing? That's because the only shares that I will have of them is one dynasty league where I had the first pick and took Elair and one dynasty league where I had the second pick and took Taylor. <laughs> and I will not get any redraft shares of them at all at their current cost. And that is terrifying. More for Taylor, I think. Um, like Clyde Edwards, Elair, we're doing a lot of heavy lifting, assigning all of this Chiefs workload to him when most of the running backs in Kansas city under Andy Reid have been at like a 55% of the running back touches and Damian Williams should probably be the reigning super bowl MVP. Um, Wait a second. Wait a second. Is that true? Because, because Spencer Ware had like 250 ish carries Kareem hunt had two straight. They went three straight years with a workhorse running back until 2000 until basically until Kareem hunt got suspended. I don't, I don't believe if you look at the actual numbers, you would qualify those guys as workhorse running backs. And I don't think Clyde Edwards, Elair, like there was nobody, I don't think, and Ben might correct me on this, before the draft that would have put Edwards, Elair in the Jonathan Taylor, J.K. Dobbins discussion. And I don't think there was anybody that would have said Edwards, Elair profiles as a future workhorse back in the NFL. Like, I, I don't I just I don't think that is the kind of guy we thought he was until the Chiefs took him. T- Taylor scares me because he could just be the best running back in the NFL. Um, I don't <laughs> yeah <laughs> don't think that's what's going to happen, especially with this super weird offseason and the fact that the Colts have acceptable options at both like two Taylor can't I don't think take over the early work and the third down work. He might take the job from Marlon Mack, but I still think Hines is going to ruin him on third down. I agree. And we'll get into, I have Damian Williams as one of the guys I'm afraid to be wrong about. And so we'll get into that in a sec, but uh, on Taylor, one thing we talked about earlier in the off season, and I kind of got away from, but noticed it again and remembered it. The Colts have easily the easiest schedule by a lot when you look at Vegas win totals and teams that they're projected to play against. And particularly in the first half of the season, their schedule is incredibly soft. So we can expect, and Frank Reich's always been pretty game script dependent on how he rolls things out, uh, meaning that when they lead, he runs. When they trail, he goes into pass-heavy mode. Some teams don't adjust their offenses quick enough. He does that very well because teams should do that. Um, So I'm expecting a lot of rushing out of the Colts in the first half of the season, particularly and they've said, yeah, it's going to be a committee. Well, that's great. There's going to be a lot of carries. That's that's my expectation. Behind a good offensive line, I think Taylor will get 15 touches a game early because I think Mack will get 12 touches or, or maybe 15 himself because they'll, they'll, they'll have plenty to go around. And then that's a lot of time also for Taylor to establish that he's just the superior player. You know, I thought a lot about the conversation we had a few days ago, Ben and Heath, but I know it was me, basically me and Ben going back and forth about how, uh, you know, you, draft, you don't draft players – you know, for week one, necessarily, you draft players to win your league. And sometimes you have to wait. And I was saying how 
I don't want to draft guys like that who I don't think are going to be contributors until late in the year with a top five pick. Well, first five rounds, top 60 pick. Um, I stand by that, but looking at the draft boards now, you might not have a choice. It's, if you want one of those rookie running backs that has high upside, you might have to bite the bullet unless it's Keyshawn Vaughn or something. But I think that's the argument for just taking a running back with your first two picks and stockpiling receivers. Yeah. Because I, I yeah. agree with you. I don't want to use a, a third round pick on a guy that I Ben said it. He doesn't know if he's gonna be able to start Jonathan Taylor early in the season. Yeah, but what about a fifth round pick? I know this is a slightly different conversation, but because if we're worried about for me, players I'm worried about being wrong about, like I just keep passing over Cam Akers, DeAndre Swift, those two it in particular. Me at all. Okay. And because Dobbins, like the, the, Dobbins doesn't bother me as much either because I think he really needs an injury. Whereas the other two guys, I feel like, could just beat out their competition. Like, Mark Ingram, I think, is still a great player. And this could just be me sticking to my guns on who I thought was better. But, like, Do- I'd re- much rather draft Dobbins in the sixth or seventh than Akers or Swift in the fifth. Uh, Dobbins is probably seventh. Um, because I don't really think those situations, like, we were talking about how many touchdowns Todd Gurley scored, but their offensive line is not good. And I think they're going to throw a lot. And I don't know necessarily know that playing a bunch of two tight end sets will be better for their running. It's just more defenders in the box. So I, I'm not particularly excited about Akers and Swift, even if they won the job. I don't think they have that top 12 upside. Dobbins, I think, if he gets the job, yeah, he, could yeah. be a top 12 running back. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Immediately. Sure. Okay, uh, let's see what we got here. Well, you want to talk about Damian Williams, and then we'll get to Heath's last, last player on Heath's list. Damian Williams for you, Ben, yeah. is a player you're worried I- about being wrong about. Yeah, I've had him pretty low, and I mean, it really ties into what he just said, and the, you know, I, I guess, I think he said it really well, where we're all just kind of assuming Clyde edwards is going to be in this really valuable role, and maybe he will be, but he was a 32nd pick. Yes, he was the only first round pick. Yes, he's, you know, uh, he was the first running back off the board, and the Chiefs, you know, selected him over players like Jonathan Taylor. But, you know, just a couple of years ago, Rashad Penny was drafted a little bit higher and um, Ronald Jones was drafted just a few picks later as one of the first picks in the second round and Nick Chubb in that same draft and Chubb wasn't used very much until they traded Carlos Hyde. And and yes, that that role opened up, but that's not going to happen with Kansas City. That was a different scenario. The Browns weren't contenders. They they dealt their their aging veteran and and opened up the you know, rolled out the red carpet for the rookie, but the, the chiefs aren't going to do that. They're a contender and they're going to, I guess what I'm trying to get at is it wouldn't really be that surprising. You know, we're doing this with AJ Dillon who also only went about 30 picks later than, than Edwards later. That's a lot, but he was a, a second round pick and we're doing it with JK Dobbins where we're saying maybe these guys were future picks. Like, is it that far fetched that the Super Bowl winning team didn't, didn't think it had that many needs that they, shored up a position because they really liked a player, but that this year won't be the year that, that Clyde Edwards Hilaire is the lead back and that instead they will stick with the guy who was the, you know, the near Super Bowl MVP. And that's, if that happens, Damian Williams is going to smash his ADP. Well, and I think like it doesn't for the chiefs, especially Edwards Hilaire's skill set fits so well with that offense. He could make five or six, eight to 10 plays a game for them that are pretty valuable for the team that leave you in a terribly frustrating position as a fantasy owner, because you don't know if it's going to be the week where he has eight touches for 50 yards and no scores or eight touches for 160 and two scores. Yeah. If you look at average draft position right now, so take away the Ravens acres and, and Ingram are going kind of back to back 50 and 52nd overall. Um, oh, and Mark Andrews going 49th. How about that little Ravens run? So, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. I meant to say uh, Dobbins. Okay, I got confused. I'll, I'll update it. Uh, when Sorry, when you look at the, the veteran running backs who are potentially being replaced by these rookies, um, Damian Williams is going way ahead of Carrion Johnson and Marlon Mack. Like, sixth round for Damian Williams, eighth round for Marlon Mack, tenth round for Carrion Johnson. And Ingram goes before them. That makes sense, obviously. But would you guys, uh, would, do you think that's right? Do you think Damian Williams then Marlon Mack, then Carrion Johnson should be separated by two rounds each. I don't think Mack should be ahead of Carrion Johnson. I think Damian Williams is in the right spot, and that's why I'm concerned because I don't draft him there, but I'm concerned that I'm going to be wrong about him. Yeah, I have Damian Williams 29th. I've got Carrion 35th and Max in the 40s. 
So yeah, I I think Carry On's probably the best value of that group. But someone the- would have to explain to me why Mac should be ahead of Carry On because it's um it's certainly a better offense, but like it it just seems a lot less likely that Mac is going to have really any kind of a role. I mean, like Hines is the clear pass catcher. Carry On can at least have like an, an early Mac's down. going to start week yeah, one. Yeah, come on. You, you, are, top 25 you are way too harsh on, on Marlon Mack. He hates him. No, like, I'm not like – they just drafted an Ezekiel Elliott plus athlete and have a pass catching back that they're talking about getting 10 plus catch games. What is Marlon Mack's role besides like eight to ten carries and no reception? He had no receiving role last year. His role, his Here. role could be fifteen carries, and it could be your boy Jonathan Taylor getting six carries. I, I will say that when I did the polls, could be. Six, fifth, fifty-five to sixty percent of my Twitter followers thought that Marlon Mack would likely lead Colts running backs in touches the first four weeks of the season. I would have voted I don't for even that. I think too. I disagree with that. I'm just saying, I think Carrion Johnson has a possibility of. I, I was trying to explain there's not a third back in the mix. Uh, and I so see. if you yes. say it's a 50 50 split, Carrion Johnson could play some on passing downs. He could have a more well rounded role. Um, yep. I don't see how Marlon Mack has like a 60% touch split upside at all. Right. And I think Carrion maybe doesn't either. Probably it's more likely that Swift leads that offense, but it's possible that Carrion Johnson has a 60% touch split role. Okay, let's look get to uh, Heath's last player here that he's worried about being wrong about. That's Mark Andrews, number two tight end in non-PPR last year, number five in PPR. He had 10 touchdowns on 98 targets. Um, and uh, very efficient, great yards per catch, great yards per target. NFC ADP for Mark Andrews is 50th. Most recent CBS draft, he went 39th overall. That was a half PPR draft. So, Heath, what are you worried about being wrong about uh, with Mark Andrews? There is a universe where Baltimore's pass rate really doesn't go up that much this year. And Marquise Brown is 100% and leads the team in targets. And Mark Andrews' efficiency regresses as it absolutely should. And he's just a fine mid-range starting tight end instead of a contender for number three. Okay. Yeah. Well said. Honestly, it's not that it's, it's that's pl- pretty plausible. I, I don't think it's going to happen, but it it's, could happen. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's very plausible. I think the one thing in his favor is we might see more routes. We've talked about that this off season, but he, he hasn't always run a ton of routes, but with Hayden Hurst going, they always liked Hurst. I mean, they drafted Hurst ahead of Andrews. Um, they don't really have someone to fill that. We might actually see Andrews run significantly more routes, which would be nice. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to continue our Ravens discussion with Lamar Jackson. What is Ben concerned about in terms of being wrong about Lamar Jackson? Find out right after this on Fantasy Football Today. And by the way, stay tuned. Apple Podcast questions, uh, your emails, and the best patriotic movies of all time. I'm trying to figure out my fifth. I've got four. I've got like 10 more minutes to come up with number five. All right, be right back. It's not easy to do. It's not easy at any position to repeat as number one. Uh, but Lamar Jackson will give it a shot. He is going 16th overall in NFC ADP. He went 27th overall in our industry draft on CBS a couple weeks ago. Ben, how do you feel about Lamar Jackson, and what are you concerned about in terms of being wrong about him? Well, I don't take quarterbacks early, and I have Patrick Mahomes ahead of him in almost every format because I just think Patrick Mahomes is that good. So the concern is that Lamar Jackson – runs for 1200 yards again. I mean, it's just basically like he's the perfect fantasy quarterback. And if he does, you know, yeah, the, the passing TDs kind of have to come down a little bit, but maybe they don't come down that much. Um, I, you know, I've, I've hypothesized, but I haven't dug into it, but that maybe his past TD rate was so high because it's such a run heavy offense. And he wasn't throwing a lot of passes in his own territory because they're moving the ball into plus territory. And then he's throwing more passes in scoring range. And maybe that has an impact on him being able to, to carry a higher pass TD rate. Cause we're just talking as a percentage of attempts and he doesn't throw a lot of attempts. Uh, so maybe he's not due for quite as much regression, who knows? But um, I think ultimately if he runs as much as he did and he's just that athletic and that good and, and, and that untackleable that teams can't scheme for him because they're going to try to, and I'm kind of expecting that they'll be able to, to some degree, but maybe they can't. And if they can't, then I'm going to be wrong, and he's going to win people leagues, even as a second-round pick. 
twelve hundred yards. You say you know he basically since becoming the starter, it's now twenty two starts, not including the playoffs. His pace has been about one thousand two hundred eighty rushing yards. He's done it two years in a row, uh, seven games in two thousand eighteen and fifteen last year. Do you think he gets to a thousand rushing yards this year, guys? Under. I don't see. I, I don't know how I could say under. <laughs> he's, he's good. He's really good at football. Yeah. I is Mahomes is safer, right? Is that fair to say? Yeah. For sure. Okay. Let's go to Austin Eckler here. Another one that Ben is worried about being wrong about. Go on. Yeah, I've just been kind of down on him all offseason. And most of the backs that I'm down on in this range have a specific type of touch profile that I don't really like. Uh, They don't catch a lot of passes and those types of things. But with Eckler, he very clearly has the exact type of um, touch profile that I love. And it's uh, not not dissimilar to say Christian McCaffrey's rookie season. And now he's working into a potentially bigger role. And I'm not saying, you know, he can go beat Christian McCaffrey, but the type of touch mix, the rush attempt and reception mix and the, the, the goal line usage, you know, if he becomes an every down player, if they play him 70% of the snaps, 75% of the snaps um, with that type of touch mix, even with his receptions almost certain to come down and his receiving efficiency almost certain to come down because of a different offense and a rushing quarterback and all those things, he will still be very, very good, you know, in, in that situation. So it's, it's a tricky one for me. I'm down on him for, for reasons that, um, you know, I don't like being down on this type of player is, is ultimately what it comes to. I, he yeah. can't, I don't, I don't like, I'm the Austin Eckler guy, obviously. I don't really believe that he could be Christian McCaffrey. But what I would say is, like, why can't he be Alvin Kamara? Yeah. I mean, that's the comparison I made last year when Melvin Gordon reported, uh, and I got ripped for it. But I said, what if Austin Eckler is just Alvin Kamara 2.0 and Melvin Gordon returns to, like, a Mark Ingram type role? And people were like, Eckler's nothing like Alvin Kamara. And then he was the rest of the year. I mean, that's because he had that touch mix. He's actually been more efficient than Kamara on a per-touch basis for the past three years. Yeah. I mean, he's, and he's got the right touch mix and the right profile. Um, yeah. I'm referencing a tweet that I sent out that got like a hundred, you know, however many likes and then a ton of people that were also telling me I was an idiot and don't understand football. So uh, I was right. And you were wrong. Idiots. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering how many carries he gets. How many carries per game does he get? I'm going to set it at 13 over or under 13 for Eckler. 13 carries per game would be, would be great. Yeah. I mean, do you think he'll get there yeah. over or under? I'm trying to do the math on how many that is per game or for the season. I think probably over, honestly. Uh, but I, I, it, it's how far down do the receptions come? We had 92 catches. They're going to lose almost 100 pass attempts. I mean, at least while Tyrod Taylor's playing, if you look at their 16 game paces, Philip Rivers and Tyrod Taylor as starters, it's literally 100 pass attempt difference. It should be. It should be 50 catch. He should be in the 50 catch group, right? At least 50. Yeah, 50 to 60 yeah. probably. And yeah, then I his got, efficiency has to come down because he was wildly efficient as a receiver last year, which is a whole last other year thing. or always. Yeah, always. Yeah, ten point three or more yards per catch. Pitching running back ever. <laughs> Might be yards per catch ten point three to ten point eight every year. There are three straight seasons. I mean, that's just like crazy I don't. Good. It's not. It wasn't a last year thing. I don't. That's the thing that I've struck. It's you mentioned it with Lamar Jackson. At some point in a player's career, we have to. Oh, it just turns out he's the best at this. He's not going to regress back to normal like other people. Um, I would guess it's going to, I think I've got him projected at 9.5 yards per catch or something, but that's still better than everyone else. Okay. The eight touchdowns is going to be hard to the eight. Yes. Scores. So uh, Kenyon Drake or Austin Eckler. I have Drake ahead, but we'll see if I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm afraid of being uh, wrong on Eckler. That's an easy, easy, for me at least, an easy split the baby. Um, Drake and non Eckler and PPR. Yeah, okay. Well, then what about half PPR, buddy? What about all the half PPR people out there? There really aren't that many of them. Um, they're definitely overrepresented on this podcast. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I have Eckler ahead by five fantasy points in half PPR. All right, DeAndre Hopkins and Derrick Henry. I don't know that we we talked a lot about Henry yesterday, so let's yeah. focus on Hopkins here. He's going 15th in NFC. He went 18th in our draft a couple weeks ago. Uh, Hopkins going to the Cardinals, and what are, you, what are you thinking about him, and what are you concerned about being wrong about? Yeah, both these guys I'm concerned about being too low on, and Henry is actually really simple. I can say it one, in one sentence. I'm just concerned he's different. 
and you know we, we talk enough about him but like the the way that i do analysis he's never going to look good but i'm just concerned that he's just a, a generational player right that um, was not one sentence sorry a couple <laughs> sentences De- <laughs> he, not everyone could be as concise as you deandre hopkins the concern is that he immediately integrates into an offense that was fourth in time uh, situation neutral time to snap last year which means they played very fast and they were below uh, average in, in play volume. And I expect their play volume to increase if they pass a lot. And if he seamlessly integrates into this offense, he's really, really good. Uh, I don't think anyone's got any question about that. And if Kyler Murray takes a step forward, like a lot of us are hoping and expecting. Um, yeah, DeAndre Hopkins, I, I have him like wide receiver six, but he could very easily just be the wide receiver one again. Like, why can't he? Uh, it's, it concerns me too. I feel like I have. I, I feel like I'm never going to draft DeAndre Hopkins, and nope. that scares me. Well, you're not going to either, Heath. I do. I I think I'm at like 11 or 12 teams completed, and I think I have him on one so far. I'd be surprised if I get him on another. Does that scare you a little bit? It really doesn't that much, but I'm not quite as confident in um, DeAndre Hopkins still being like. He can, I guess he could get 160 targets. I just don't think that's very likely. And he's not ever been efficient enough to be the wide receiver one with 145 targets. Mm, okay. Ooh. Well, uh, but he doesn't have to be wide receiver one. Have you ever seen the catches this guy's made, though? He makes great catches. <laughs> but, like, we, the thing is, like, Michael Thomas catches a lot of flack about it's just receptions. He doesn't do anything with them. He's a possession guy. He's well ahead of DeAndre Hopkins in yards per target. It is kind of interesting. Like, I just feel like the stats don't tell the story about how good DeAndre Hopkins, how elite he is, because um, they do tell a, a good player, a great well, player. Even. But they, they but he, tell you how good he is at getting targets, and that is also, I agree with Ben, that's also a skill. Yeah. But he has not been elite on the targets he's received. Like Julio Jones gets 150 targets and is going to average nine yards a target. Um, Hopkins has really been that guy once or twice in his career, but for the most part, not. Yeah. All right. Well, I bet he loves himself a nice patriotic movie. I'll tell you that about DeAndre Hopkins. <sighs> I I had trouble with this. I stole two well, was, from from Schrager. The worst idea you've ever had. I don't think so. <laughs> it, 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 this is, uh, like unquestionably the worst idea. Why? You've ever had. Why do you say that? Second. Um, just start your list. You want my list first? I, you've only got four, and we have to give you your fifth. So Okay, yeah. So I'm trying to think of number five. Like, I'm trying to think of movies like Best of the Best, where USA has to win something. But that movie sucks, so I can't, I can't go with that. Uh, so five is empty right now. Four is The Sandlot. Three is Rocky Four. Two is Miracle. One is The Patriot. I mean, the Patriot, the Patriot has to be number one. It is the most patriotic movie, and it's really, really good. Why the Sandlot? I mean, the Sandlot to me is just you watch that movie and you wish your childhood had been like that. Yeah, you know, safe streets. And your childhood wasn't like this, Adam. No, of course not. Like I didn't have everybody a... else's was like that. <laughs> yeah, just go go to the Sandlot down the street with your buddies like every day and go to the exactly. community pool yeah. with yeah. them and kiss the lifeguard. No, that, that's what did you? We all had friends, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> uh no, I had to, I didn't have any friends on my street. I had to ride I rode my bike to my friend's house like a uh, 10 minute bike ride. I had that, but I we didn't like go, I don't know. We played football. I guess it was somewhat similar, but I don't know. That just felt like more Americana than mine. I'm not sure. Uh like middle America. I, I don't know. Um okay, well the Did you grow like, up? Did you grow up in the, in New York? No, I grew up in South Florida. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, like, you did not grow up in middle America, so you shouldn't really expect to have that experience. I'm saying the Sandlot felt more American than my childhood. (laughs) Okay. Like the quintessential American childhood. What does it mean to be American? Like, that's the problem with this whole exercise. Yeah, well, it's 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 a matter of interpretation. But you also had the great Fourth of July scene, America the Beautiful, and. Um, I don't know. I just it was great. It was a good call. You're talking a very traditional, very old school version of america and patriotism yeah. yeah i think so i think so uh okay who wants to go next heath why don't you go next you really like my list i'm just gonna say before i get to my list because I, we have a half 
dozen holidays scattered throughout the year to celebrate our patriotism. And they all kind of honor a certain aspect of it. And for me, like the 4th of July is actually Independence Day and it's celebrating us signing the Declaration of Independence. And I think it's important to remind people that like if those people had been ultra patriots, we wouldn't have the Declaration of Independence because that would not have been very patriotic to leave their homeland <laughs> or to tell the king that they were you're, not going to be like, subjected to him anymore. That's you're not a turncoat. Like they, those, they were citizens of a different country who told the leader of that country to piss off. We're starting our own country. And that's what we're celebrating. Good for them. I support yes. them. I, I do too. I'm and that's sure why my do. movies kind of reflect all that right. spirit. All right. All right. Let's go. What do you got? The Free State of Jones, a fantastic movie. Uh, Jones County, based on a true story, declared their independence from the Confederate Army and established a county in the South that was free. And defectors from the Confederacy and freed slaves defended that county until the Union arrived. Really? That's very interesting. Yes. That okay. is very interesting. I've never heard that. That's number five on your list? Uh, that's number one. That's number one. Okay. Yes. Number two is Captain America Civil War. Captain America declared his independence <laughs> from the Avengers and world governments to fight for what he thought was right. And it turns out he was right. Did he join? Did he rejoin the Avengers at some point? At some point, yes. Oh, okay. So we're just going to like go join the European Union or not something in like that, that? Not in that movie. Okay. In that movie, he leaves them with a cell phone and says, if you need me, here you go. Okay. I love but, how you went from like <laughs> a, a very a interesting first story to you Captain know, America. Uh, yeah. Captain America, yeah. right, yeah. Um, mine was, my number three was The Patriot. I agree with Adam. Like, it has to be on this list. It's literally about a man fighting against the British in the Revolutionary War. I don't know what else That's, would be on this list if yeah. not that. My number four was Django Unchained. And this is a story about someone who earns his freedom, becomes a badass, and kills all the bad guys. <laughs> I do not know what's more American than that. Well, I, <laughs> so, I mean, what's what's more American, Quentin Tarantino, Django Unchained or Inglorious Bastards? Why did you go with Django there? Um, I think Django. Yes. Okay. Um, and then number five is Independence Day because it's literally the name of the movie. It is a really it's poorly named movie. Literally the name of it the movie. It is a poorly named movie. It, it Why really... did you also choose Born on the Fourth of July? Um, that that would have been number six, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really, the more I think about it, it is like the Die Hard thing. I really, Independence Day is not a Fourth of July movie. It has it is nothing the to do with Fourth of July. Independence Day movie. And the name of the holiday is Independence Day. Yeah, it has nothing to do with Independence Day. It's fighting aliens, and it just so happens. We got independence that... from the aliens. Yeah, yeah. They wanted to control us, and sure. we didn't let them. Let, let's get Shraggy B on there, America. <laughs> Shraggy B. All right. Well, easy one for me was the Sandlot. That is like literally America growing up, childhood. You're you're scared of throwing your ball over the fence because of the neighbor, because of the dog, and then from that. Miracle. Are you go are you going five, four, three, two, one, or what? I'll go one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Sandlot one, miracle two. Miracle two. I mean, how do you not have goosebumps during all the USA chants? And then I think some of the military movies deserve to be in the July 4th patriotic category. So number three for me, saving private Ryan. I mean D-Day, American Heroes. Number four, Zero Dark Thirty. Obviously, this is more along my lifetime because this was like the not war, but this is what the military was involved with during my 23 years on this planet it was zero dark 30 and Osama bin Laden. So that was just really patriotic movie. And finally, number five, national treasure. I mean, their treasure map declaration of independence. It's perfect. Fantastic movie. Yeah. I should see that one. Zero dark 30 is so good. I mean, saving private Ryan is the best movie of yeah. all time, but zero dark 30 is so good. Good call. Ben. Wait, then why didn't you choose saving private Ryan? I, because my list is more like, uplifting um kind of almost cheesy patriotism saving private ryan is a very heavy movie i i don't think i'd want to watch it on on july 4th it, it's it's just too serious for me you know uh, i mean these aren't movies we're watching on july 4th these are patriotic movies well 
I my list was my my list was Independence Day movies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Ben Gresh. All right, I have uh, I had about a million because that's how I do really. Things. But um, you go in one through five or five to one. I didn't even rank them. So I'll, I, I I want to put a bunch of kind of war and war adjacent movies. I chose Glory, I think, uh, and I haven't seen that for a really long time, but I think that is, uh, along with Heath's kind of point, I don't think there's a lot more patriotic than the first black regiment to fight in the Civil War, freed men and, and escaped slaves who decided to go fight uh, for their freedom, essentially. I think that's about as patriotic as it gets right there. So we'll put that number one. I had Saving Private Ryan as well, so that is number two. Um, I'll put Force Gump number three. I think that's a pretty patriotic or at least Americana type movie in the same kind of vein as Sandlot, a little bit different, but uh, I think similar explanations. I'm going to go with Lincoln four. I thought Lincoln was a really good uh, acting job by Daniel Day-Lewis. He's phenomenal, so I, I have that on here as well. And then I added as my fifth, and I had a lot of options here. I could have went with you know, Armageddon. Air you don't Force have to list one. all the movies you've ever seen now. <laughs> Air Force One. I've never seen The Patriots, so I couldn't have put that on there. Whoa, Ooh, that's, a big, um, that's a big miss for you. I went with A Few Good Men, which is maybe my favorite all-time movie. It's maybe not really all that patriotic, but I think there is something <laughs> patriotic about, about um, you know, uh, being held to account for, you know, doing bad things. I think I just wanted, I just was looking for movies that were like, yeah, America, you know, like that's what I was looking so, for. So then that's the other one that I mentioned in our, our thread, Team America World Police. But that's they, like, let's... that's poking fun at America. That's satirical. It's true. Right. Uh, all right. So I have to pick one from this group of 15, huh? You know, I Glory did come to mind. So that's a pretty good one. I think that that belongs on the list. Okay, glory for me. We'll put that. We'll put yeah. that in the top five. Good call. I'm sorry. Yeah, Rocky five. Rocky four is like should be on your list, right? Yeah. yeah I mean, the, and Top Gun. I mentioned those as well. That's but a bad movie. Like a, they're, yeah, they're, you, you don't want to have bad movies on there just because they're patriotic. Even Rocky four. It's like I mean, it's a good, very good movie, but it's just like a very uh, cheesy version of patriotism in my mind. I'm not trying to that's like what hate I was, on it. But. That's what I was going for. It was all about the, yeah. You know, Red Dawn also came to mind, but I don't think that's that good of a movie, unfortunately. Red Dawn way ahead of Rocky Four, as in terms Other of what? In terms of patriotism or just movie quality? Patriotism, and I'd rather watch Red Dawn again than Rocky Four again. Oh no, that's that's a bad take. Put it on the list. I watch Red Dawn pretty much whenever it's on. The original or the new one? Original, yeah, of course. Yeah, Wolverines. Colin from Detroit. Let's go to our Apple Podcast questions. This is in a 12-team PPR tight end premium dynasty league. Gray the trade. Give up Saquon Barkley. Get James Conner, J.K. Dobbins, and Hayden Hurst. D. Um, C minus. The tight end premium helps a lot. From Cheetos Jesus. Full PPR Dynasty startup. I've got Daniel Jones, Breeze, and Rivers. Running backs are Damian Williams, James Conner, and Hines. In the rookie draft, should I lock up the Chiefs backfield or go with Joe Burrow as my quarterback of the future? Uh, take Clyde. I'd want to know how many teams this is. If it's 12 teams, I think it, it's a lot harder to get a quarterback, and you have Breeze and Rivers both potentially playing their final season, you might you might want to grab Burrow. But I, I'm, I'm inclined to say Clyde in most scenarios. He said it was a 12-team league. Yeah. I don't know. With those two old quarterbacks, I'd probably go Burrow here, actually. Really? You're going Burrow over Clyde? It's really hard to get QBs in 12-team. So, oh, it's not I mean, super flex? I was assuming this is no, super no, flex. No, no, And the he's got Danny one. Dimes, too. Like, he can have a mediocre quarterback if he needs to. Yeah, them. yeah, yeah. No, it's not super flex. Don't draft Burrow. But I, the fact that he was considering Burrow made me think that it was super flex. No, don't draft Burrow. Okay. I, I want to know, like, of all the quarterbacks drafted in the last two seasons, mm -hmm. not in 2018 and 2019. Can we go three seasons, please, for this question? No, no. I'd like, like to go three seasons. The last two seasons. Where would you rank Daniel Jones among 
all the quarterbacks drafted in 2018 and 2019. He is in the Josh Allen, Mitchell Trubisky tier. Mitchell yep. Trubisky? Yep. Daniel Jones is in the same tier as Mitchell Trubisky? Yes. How good do you think Wait he is? Wait a second. Trubisky's been in the league three years, right? That's what I'm. That's why I said. That's why I wanted to go three years because I wanted to include. I knew what you were going to ask. So you don't think you don't I, think Daniel Jones is good. I don't think we know for sure. I'm not as. I, I will say this also. Like part of the reason I put Trubisky in there is I'm not also as convinced as everyone else that Trubisky is terrible. Um, but I don't think any of them are very good as passers. But if they're used the right way as runners and schemed up the right way, they can be acceptable starting quarterbacks. I, I think Daniel Jones is a lot better of a passer than his. Than his numbers would indicate. He makes some really good passes. And you think Lamar Jackson is a lot worse of a passer than his numbers would indicate. Yeah, well, that, I think, yeah, for sure. But I, I'm not saying Jones... Actually, I do think Jones is probably a better pure passer than Lamar Jackson. But that there's was, been zero evidence since they were in high school that that's true. Mm, I don't know about that. I mean, Jackson's a better player. But, yeah, I don't know. Statistically. Statistically? Yeah. If, if you would put Daniel Jones in Bobby Petrino's offense, he would have put up big numbers. Like every quarterback that goes to Washington State does. I think know? if you put Lamar Jackson in Duke's offense, Duke would have been good. Well, Duke wasn't terrible with him. I mean, I think they had like one decent year. Okay. Um, <laughs> so it's from Chucky Buckle. How do bye weeks? Uh, you know what? I'm going to I really do predict that Daniel Jones is, his accuracy is going to go way up this year. His per- completion percentage is going to go way up this year. Um, how do bye weeks change your decisions in drafting slash rankings in the first couple rounds? Do you try to keep all your starters on different bye weeks? Or are you okay with having a majority of your starters at the same week or two? Do not look at them at all. Mostly ignore them. Um, it depends on format, of course. Yeah, there's a couple formats where they get relevant. But for me, I, I've actually tried it both ways. And I, I don't hate when I stack my buys. People get really mad about that. But essentially means that you have a pretty significant disadvantage for one week, and you're not even a guaranteed loser if your opponent has a really horrible week against you, which can happen. And then every other week you have a slight advantage because you're going to be playing teams that are on buys, and all your your lineup's full every week, and it works out kind of well actually sometimes. Next question: uh, Hi, Eric, Andrew, Austin, Laurent, and Mitchell. Laurent Robinson, Austin Prol. Mitchell, who this has got to be like Rams receivers or something. I have no who, idea. Who's Andrew and Eric and Mitchell? Maybe it's a college that they all went. These to. are like his friends. Come on. Uh, two hundred dollar auction, twelve team league. Who should I keep? I can only keep one. Miles Sanders, thirty seven. Kenyon Drake for thirty. Austin Eckler for twenty five. Eckler. If you can keep him for multiple seasons, it gets a lot tougher because Eckler's already twenty five. It's non PPR. Oh, standard. And Drake's like 27. I think I might keep Sanders. I can't keep Sanders for 50% more than Austin Eckler, even in non. Sorry. From Jonathan, dear Jeff, Blair, Cortez, and Keith. Cortez Kennedy. <laughs> Just naming Blair Thomas. Football players. I, I mean, is the, uh, it seems like it would be Seahawks if Cortez Kennedy. I don't really know a lot of other Cortezes. Yeah, same. Let's see. Jeff, Blair, Cortez, and Keith. Cortez Kennedy, I don't know Jeff any other George, Seahawks, those Blair Thomas. I think these were, they may have been in the same draft. Okay. Um, all right. Do you think DeAndre Hopkins will regress in 2020, and where would you draft him? Regress is not the word that I would use. I would not draft him until late second. Yeah, I'm more like mid-second, but you usually don't even get him there, so... This is from Landry. Dear Ty, X, Falcon, and at, at, at. <laughs> Star Wars. Oh, really? Machines? Okay. Yeah, all right. Star Wars. Probably should have known that. No, nah, I shouldn't have known that. I've barely seen Star Wars. I've got some beef with everyone's appraisal of Joe Mixon. Everyone's saying that based on the second half of the season, Mixon is trending up. He's not at all. The Bengals threw their season. That's why they started giving him the ball 25,000 times a game. How are you all so high on him? Why not take a Josh Jacobs, Sanders, Kelsey, Kittle over him? Preach. Wait, who it, are you really high on him, Heath? Uh, Dave and Jamie and the industry. He's like a consensus first round pick. Yeah, I got um, him. I, I I have him like right around where I have Eckler, RB8, RB9, both of them. 
I think I have him RB15 in PPR. Ooh, um, spicy. Like, if he plays 16 games this season, then I'm sure he will finish in the top 12. But there's been, like, there's been a lot of hoping for things for Joe Mixon for three years now that we have not seen. But it's not like he's been bad. No, but it's not like he's been great. Yeah, and I get annoyed that everybody just forgets about the first eight games where he sucked. I get annoyed that everybody every single year talks about what he's going to do in the passing game this year, and maybe this year will be the year and I'll look stupid, but they just don't throw him the ball. Well, and he doesn't play enough snaps. He doesn't play enough passing downs. It's not just they don't throw him the ball. He doesn't run the routes. Even last year with the new head coach, I think he only broke 75% of the snaps a couple times. It's not too dissimilar from the stuff we talk about with Aaron Jones. They still use Giovanni Bernard in the passing game, and people think they don't. I think I feel like Heath has made this comparison, but if you just look at touches, Chris Carson and Joe Mixon are pretty similar, and Carson will have more care. Based on the last two years, Carson gets more carries, and the catches could be fairly similar. The past two years, they have been almost identical. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks for the question, Landry. Hope we did not, you know, piss you off with our Joe Mixon take. I think we're probably on the same page there. Emails. This is from Chris in Rocket City. Dear Russ, Joe, Jeff, Raleigh, and Don. Hopefully Jamie is on if you if you read this since he's the reliable historian. Wow, that's Russ. really mean. Obviously, I know this. I have no idea what this is. <laughs> You've talked a bit about COVID contingencies during the season. My league doesn't want to get complicated like best bench points for out players, etc. We've had three proposals. Wanted to see which you like the best. First, add a third IR spot to the league for a year. Second, add two rounds and bench spots to the league to give us options for day off outs. Third is do both. What do you think? Second. Yeah, if you already have two IR spots... I don't know if I've ever played in a league with two IR spots, to be oh. honest with you. Russ, Joe, Jeff, Raleigh, and Don might be Redskins, Washington linemen, maybe the Hogs. I'm not sure. Is it Raleigh Williams or something? What is it? I don't know. Raleigh, North Carolina? Yeah, I think it's Raleigh, North Carolina was one of the linemen. Yeah, Alan really from good lineman. outside of Boston. <laughs> Oh, this one I know. Hey, Adam, Michael, George, Val, and Christian. Come on, guys. Are those are uh, Batman. Oh, those are Batman. Sorry, I'm looking up Raleigh. Oh, it's Raleigh McKenzie. Who, who, yeah, those are Batman for sure. I heard Ben mention to a, uh, a fantasy team as a living, ever-changing organism from draft to championship. It's a great call by Ben, as usual. I don't Ooh. think we talk about this idea enough. Do we need to start approaching our weekly home league with a daily league mindset. Last year, I won my standard league championship with only two players from my original draft. Somewhat, yeah. I mean, the, the daily league mindset depends. I certainly, mid-season, will take uh, that type of approach with teams that I don't think are as strong as some of the top teams in the, in the league. I will try to acquire, before the trade deadline, high-variance players. I've won championships this way. Uh, I know it was like three or four years ago, but I intentionally did this acquired T Y Hilton that year. He was great down the stretch acquired players like that, that were considered more boom bust. And if they can string together some boom games for you, you get this kind of DFS GPP type upside in your weekly lineup so that you can at least, at least you have that upside. And now I just tend to, to draft for upside everywhere. But um, I think if you have a really good team, you want, you know, you don't need to. You don't need to treat it that way. You, you can do things a little bit differently. And last question, guys, before we get into our Fourth of July weekend. This is from Austin. Not sure if this was your intention, but the podcast the other day convinced me that Golden Tate is easily the best value of the three Giants wide receivers. I'm looking at his stats right now and didn't realize how well he played last year. If he's going to last, if he's going last out of that group, that seems like the best value. Golden Tate, best Giants wide receiver value. I can't disagree with that. This person was obviously not listening to Ben through the podcast, um, <laughs> but like he is obviously their most accomplished wide receiver. And last year on a per game basis, I think he was their best wide receiver. So if he's going last, like I don't expect him to be the best this year, but going two rounds after Shepard and after Slayton, for some reason, I, I think it's definite that he's their best value. Ooh. Okay. Well, 
everybody, please have a great weekend. Have a lot of fun. Have a Coors Light. Drink responsibly. And uh, we will talk to you on Monday as we begin Projections Week. Watch yourself a patriotic movie. Rocky IV will do. And thanks a lot to, of course, the Bens, to Heath, and to all of you for listening. Happy 4th. Talk to you Monday. See ya. Want more of the Fantasy Football Today podcast and nonstop year-round fantasy advice? It's simple. Hit the subscribe button and hang with us all throughout the year.